And yeah, I think that's really what this this series is about. It's kind of giving. Um, I mean, this series is about the journey from starting out as a new trader to um, becoming a professional trader. And as we've talked about um, before in our last interview with with Lucci, you know, we define a professional trader as someone who is making their income from trading. Right? You know, this is this is you are showing up every day, and it is your goal to make a living from trading. That doesn't mean that you're trading with you know firm capital or anything like that. You could absolutely be trading on your own, but you view trading as your profession. It's not just a hobby for or, uh, you know, something you do on the side, you know, pulling up Robin Hood when you're in between meetings or something like that, right? So we know a lot of people in our community, um, you know, in our following, like that is their goal. They want to be full-time independent, you know, as we would call professional traders. And so we said, uh, why not have our team of educators, the the people, the, the, the guys who teach our master course, come on and talk about that. Talk about their journey. Talk about how they overcame the obstacles that they faced when they started out as traders. Talk about the things that they've learned from watching other pros out there and, and qualities that, that y'all can emulate. So I am, this is the second episode in our series, and I'm joined by the one and only Chris Katie. Chris, say hello to everybody. Hi, everybody. Um, and, you know, we, uh, what did we call this one? This one for you is the hallmarks of a pro with Chris Ooh. Katie. So, um, so we're going to do two things today with Chris. We are going to talk um, about his journey personally, Chris, kind of what you went through when you started out trading, which was back in 1980. Um, and... <laughs> And, um, and some of, especially what you experienced more in the beginning of, uh, of what it was like and, and how you overcame the obstacles that, you know, that you faced. And then, um, you know, Chris, you had the incredible opportunity to be mentored by some of the biggest names in the industry. Yeah. Um, and I'm going to ask you to give a quick bio here in a second. Um, but so we'll talk about that. And then the second half, I want to talk about some of what you learned and what you focused on when you were training new traders for Goldman Sachs. Um, so for, for those of you who don't know, Chris spent about five years, right, Chris? Yeah. Um, training new traders for Goldman. That was part of what he was doing while also trading. Um, and uh, I'm very interested to know what the, the lessons I think that, that you took out from, from, from that experience that we can pass on to, to some of the people here. So that's what we're going to do today. Okay. Um, if you wouldn't mind, give everybody the one minute summary of, of your bio when you got started and how it went from there. Yeah. Um, thanks, Charlie. That's wonderful. And thanks everybody for chiming in and watching. Um, I'll try and, and frame this in a way that maybe uh, helps other people along the way if they're if they're considering this path. Uh, I started as a summer job uh, when I was 19, uh, working on the floor uh, for Walter Frank. I volunteered for two weeks. And after two weeks, he said, as a clerk, as you do, uh, this is in 1980. So there were no computers. Everything was written by hand. So every trade had to be entered on a form uh, and then reconciled through these giant uh, old school printer uh, sheets of paper uh, the next morning. And then you had to make sure that, that everything had cleared through what was called SIAC, which uh, came from the other end of uh, Water Street. And they all delivered these giant sheets. But I asked him, you know, I asked if I, if I could work for him. And he said, yes, how much do you need? And I said, 250 a week. I knew how much the clerks got paid. Because <laughs> you ask around, right? And uh, that was Walter Frank, and uh, he was chairman of New York Stock Exchange. And so being the new kid on the block, I got to meet a lot of very big, you know, guys who would be standing there, have a position uh, on the, in a particular name with, a, say, a 100,000 share position, and he, they'd be like, let's go get lunch. <laughs> So, um, but among the things that I did learn that I think are helpful to people was on the very first day, someone said, you can ask any question, just don't ask it twice uh, mm -hmm. because then they'll know you're stupid. Mm -hmm. uh, another thing that I learned was uh, never be afraid to admit you're wrong. In fact, admit you're wrong quickly. If you don't know, or if you've made a mistake, don't defend a mistake. And even as a clerk, you know, you, you were writing out trades. So don't, don't defend mistakes. Uh, and then being curious was always uh, sort of recommended. And then 
non -judge, non judgmental about things that you don't understand. In other words, uh, certain behaviors when people were under stress, you had no idea why that person was acting the way they do they did, but other people on the floor knew enough to know that there was a story, but that person was just not crazy. There was a reason for, for the stress reactions that that person had. So mm -hmm. when you're starting out in the business, you know so little and it's so intriguing and it seems somewhat entertaining and, and daunting in regards to the amount of data and things there are to know. Um, I would say the beginning is actually the easiest because you only have certain particular things to learn. And then as you progress, as you get into the intermediate phases of things, it becomes much more difficult because you've seen different scenarios happen that you weren't aware of when you first started. So mm. it seems when you first start out that everything's so black and white. And then as you become more experienced, you start to see the nuances and then from there, then you have to start to weigh the different probabilities of the nuances that you've seen and you become like an, an arbiter or a judge sort of listening to two cases in the courtroom and you have to weigh which one has a greater probability and that that takes longer than, than people think it is. In, in other words, when you first get going, everything seems like, oh, just buy them or price goes up or the price goes down. But then as you become aware of, of how prices move, you recognize or you start to see that there are better places to get on the roller coaster and better places to get off the roller coaster than when you first got going hmm. and that it, it becomes much more nuanced. And so um, the advice there is, is that, um, you need to stay in the game, but for example, if you if you have a new company, the first year you sell to all your friends, it's the second year where you start to face true competition. Then your revenue numbers start to decline because then you're in a marketplace and you've already exhausted all your friends. So now you're actually going to unfriendly accounts to try and sell whatever widget that you have. Right. So um, I, I worked for Walter. Uh, I started. He gave me my membership and. In of the exchange in the in the eighty in nineteen eighty, I it took about nine months for the government to process my security clearance. I wanted to keep the mafia out of the, the securities industry. Oh, which, so, which, so were you just so you were clerking the whole time then? Yeah, I had to wait, and then I got my uh, my letter from the CFTC, which allowed me to trade on the floor, execute brokerage brokerage orders, and trade the house account. Uh, in April of twenty of 1981, when I was 20 years old, making me the youngest member in the world. Uh, so, and, and, uh, and 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 so sorry to cut you off, but like, so what what level of? I mean, was it just basically like, okay, you're in now, get out there and 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 try something, just play some trades, or what, what kind of like training or mentorship were you, were you getting at that point? Like, who was guiding you? How were you being guided? The exchange, well, we have to understand we did not have technical analysis. We didn't have computers. Right. Right. All we had were people doing point and figure charts or bar charts on graph paper. Um, and the markets also distributed themselves more horizontal, more horizontally. Um, so that there was there wasn't this ginormous momentum vertical action that we have as in today. Uh, but to, to, let's see, to help the other people, uh, you, the floor at that time was an environment where people helped people. There was a professional courtesy. Someone had a chart, you could go look at it over their shoulder, or you could ask somebody what the news was, or people would pass around newsletters. Mm. And, and those, those were, and at the time, it's like the best version of Twitter for us right now. Right. Like, yes. Good, good, good Twitter, not shitty Twitter. Yeah. There was a definite connection between the guys on the floor and the people in Congress would, and the senators would always come to the floor and share information. There was also uh, incredible connections between parts of the military intelligence, the CIA and the guys on the floor wanting to know Ooh. what was happening and either, and they would trade information back and forth because every order came through the floor and we were the only people to see it. Right. And so it was as though you knew everybody at the party, where they were along from, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, at the time, you could also, you know, I was friends with Peter Kellogg of Spear Leads and Kellogg, and I would ask Peter, 
you know, why are you, why are you getting short? Like he would sell like 500 index futures. I'd be like, what are you doing? And he's like, well, the market's never, the Dow's never been up more than 20 points. So boy, the Dow's up 25 points. So I'm getting short. And I was like, Whoa. okay, that made perfect sense to him. But right. to me, it was just an arbitrary number. And so, um, so were you, there, were you, oops, there was no, I'm sorry, there was no us against them. There was no high frequency. There was no programs. There were, everything was done at a much slower pace. So it allowed for you to adjust accordingly. And because everything had to be done in person, there was, uh, if, you know, you couldn't just hit the mouse. So um, to, to everyone else, I'm not so sure that a lot of these experiences from a long time ago are relevant to today, though I think a lot of the rules that we traded by are relevant to today. And I think that knowing a part of the class, I think that's important to recognize is that we've curated both experiences and rules and lessons over the years to save you having to go through the same 40 years of experience uh, and throwing out what rules don't work anymore and then keeping the rules and actually now creating new rules for this environment that we've done through the conversations that we're having with people at, at Lucci in the steam room. Yeah. So um, did, did you, Chris, did you have, um, I mean, some people talk about, especially when, when trading was in real life, when you were, you know, in the physical presence of other people, of like first stepping into the floor or into the pit and just feeling the energy and being like, this is where I need to be. This is my calling. I know it. Did you have that sort of experience or were you, did you have moments of doubt where you were like, I don't know. No, it, it, you know, have you been to the, when the lights go out at a Stones concert? I mean, in the old no. days, right? That's like, no. a, right. <laughs> <laughs> when the lights go out at a big anticipated concert and you hear that sort of electric rush that goes through the arena, it's kind of like that, but it's more like NASA meets Vegas, right? There's all this technology <laughs> plus a bunch of like really sort of mysterious characters who are misfits generally or trust funders and, and or just guys that are, you know, just huge shooters like Lucci and Cowboys. And right. so uh, there, yeah, when you hit the, when you hit the trading floor, it was a visceral energy that would create an adrenaline response in most people and uh, it encouraged risk. And there was sort of a collective mentality too, where the, the ring would team up against say Goldman or, or Bear Stearns or somebody big, and we would take on, you know, the ring would take on the orders. <laughs> And then eventually, of course, the the houses, you know, Bear Stearns and Goldman got bigger than the ring. Right. But for a while there, the ring was had more money than the houses. Right. So, um, of course, that, you know, so it, it became where the broker would come in and say, what's here? And we would tell them what the prices were. And then when the, all of a sudden, when Goldman and Bear Stearns got bigger than the cap, got more capital than the people on the floor, the brokers would would come in and say what's here and we would just say you tell us because mm -hmm. you're bigger than us you're going to run us over right right and that right. was an interesting transition that you know and then i think now as traders we need to be cognizant of the fact that not any one of us functions in the group uh and also all the capital out there far far outpaces what we have as an individual right, right. that relationship has just gotten more and more extreme yeah um, and so so that just, you know, that requires that you have your ducks in a row from a mental perspective and an emotional perspective. So you don't go down the rabbit hole of thinking one thing and you don't have anybody there to talk you out of your opinion of, you know, you used to have that on the floor. People would be like, you know, maybe you should rethink that. And here by ourselves or in a collection of the room, you need to have that ability to, to say, I need to rethink this without somebody telling you. And I think these are the things that you pick up in the, in the masterclass is that um, there's a blueprint that you're going to need for both your emotional and your, your professional psych out, sort of your perspective from the way you think that I think is very important to take into the trading arena. Um, and when we take care of that uh, in the master class, at least in, in my end of the three or four psych classes uh, of the, the 
shall we say, the procedures, the protocols from the minute you wake up to the minute you hit the mouse and then right. what to do when you have a losing streak and what to do when you have a big winner and how not to celebrate and how to celebrate and things like that, which nobody really talks about. But we've seen over the years of people who have blown out and lost everything. You know, what were the mistakes they made? And you were standing next to them, you know, as they were making the decision to lose everything and their, you know, their whole lives worth of work. So, well, let's, let's talk about that now, man. Let's, let's go there. One of the questions that we got at the end of the la of the interview with Lucci was, you know, how do you get yourself out of a mental hole, which is something that I think people, people know that professionals have to bounce back faster, right? If you, you know, if you're doing this recreationally, you can get into a hole and you can walk away for six months and then come back. Pros need to be able to bounce back a lot faster. Do you remember seeing traders kind of in your early days um, and, and, watching them get themselves into a mental hole and how they were yeah. able to, to get themselves out. Yeah. I mean, sometimes I've watched many friends, uh, big guys, bigger than me, um, blow out in the ring in front of me. And it was though they had an idea and then they got so underwater so quickly, um, that they just thought that they, they had no choice, but to just bet everything. Hmm. And, um, and so I would suggest that, you, you know, that happens to people. I've seen it happen. And the idea is, is not to go there. Um, part of the, part of the benefit of, of, of at least having the ability to talk to people in the steam room, as well as your own, how do you want to say this? Your own, you want to have like the hook that they used to drag people off stage, take yourself out of the game. Yeah. Some people do it with money. Some people do it with a number of winning or losing or losing trades in a row. Um, but the, the boundaries, the rules that we talk about are, are uh, time tested. And I think that they have to be enforced. Your question was how, how do you get yourself back? Uh, I mean, there's two, two things that we need to think about when we were talking about earlier was that you can't, you can't get closure from the market. You want a room, you want, you can't, transcend trauma you just you end up living with the pain that you've experienced so that you use it as a motivating force and that only way that you can deal with the fact that eight out of ten people lose everything that means eight out of ten trades we possibly make are going to be losers which means that we got to get out of losers quickly mm -hmm. and and we have to have good boundaries because you can't control the market right so that leaves you you the new trader or the midterm trader with the with the need for boundaries because there are so many things that don't make sense. And if you think about that sense is just your, your perception of what's logical and the markets are moving with people who have information that we're not privy to and more money. So the, we're really just stuck with having, creating good rules and sticking by them. If you wish to remain in the game forever and be a pro then once you have the good rules, then you have to discern what are the right tools to use. And currently Charlie's and, and the Lucci crew are assembling a, just a beautiful suite of the highest indicators for these, the, the program indicators, the tape indicators are really like 21st century stuff. That's great. I have some stuff from Stottlemyre, the, the cap flow stuff that I'll run through the data segmentation. Um, and then, of course, there's all the cliches over all the years of, you know, what the behaviors I don't add to a losing trade. You know, uh, you know, there, you know, there are no such things as triple bottoms. Um, you know, it always breaks the flat side of a triangle. All the, you know, all the sort of trader maxims that we've gone through for years, for decades. But the understanding is, is that they work for a reason and we can explain them in a way that makes sense. So that if you're sitting at the dinner table and somebody says, well, why is this a maxim? You can tell them for good reason. You know, you'd never want a second chance at something to say. And why is that? Because if it's a real opportunity, the price, so many people want to buy it, the price should move away from there quickly, right? So if it comes back and gives you a second chance, that means that there's no certainty. Anytime there's no certainty in the market, you can't lean against something. We're looking for one shot opportunities for certainty, not two, not a test. A mm -hmm. test is not certain. But anyway, these are just, these are one, some of the many sort of old, like old wives tales, Mac uh, trading cliches that are 
that are used that um, that we go through in the class, and um, they're valid for a reason, and and they make sense once you explain them. What Charlie and I've always talked about doing a class about why some technical indicators don't work. You know why why trend lines don't work, or why you know why are stochastics always late and things like that, and you know and uh, you know, why do crashes occur from oversold conditions and things like that? Yeah. Um, and maybe someday we'll get around to that, but I'm sorry to, to, to drag. No, on. all good. No, all good. I mean, I'm just, I think, I think there's a lot, like everything you're saying is absolutely on point and, and, and true. I think that there's a lot of people who are in here who are like, okay, I, I get it. I need to have good rules and I can't just trade off instinct. And, and right. I, you know, I understand that that's important and, and that's something that professionals do, but let's, I mean, in the circumstance where, like every trader at some point is going to take a loss that just kind of brings them to their knees. Right. And right. I think there's, there's, we have a lot of people who come to us and say like, how do I make it through those points? Like how, what do you know, what do I do? I mean, I don't know if you have a, a yeah, time I in mean, your career yeah, where you were like, I mean, yeah. anytime you've had a broken heart and anytime you have a big losing day, people say, put on your uniform, stand on the playing field. You don't have to even trade, just go there, turn on your screens, trade micros, trade super small, trade one share. Right. And just go through the motions because just show up, show up. Yeah. You have to transform what was pain and you have to use that pain. You're not going to make the, the painful experience go away. Right. You can't. All right. So that means you have to act through pain and that's similar to acting through fear. There is a sense of accomplishment when you execute through fear. And there is a sense of sort of redemption when you act through pain and you know, any spiritual path is all about death and rebirth as though it's an upward spiral. And in this game, you could consider loses, losses as a form of death. And you, there's a particular aspect of your logic or your, your methods which die. You can't do it again or you'll get blown out. So mm. in a sense, you're dying and being reborn. And so, you, you know, they have always said that birth is a painful process, right? I guess you cry as soon as you come out of the womb there. So. Yeah. Uh, there's no getting around the fact that you're going to experience pain. So yeah. you want to make sure that you're ready to, you know, die and be reborn and, and use that as a motivating force to change in a positive fashion, not as one that holds you back and, and makes you fear-based or anxiety-based. And until you can make it as a positive sort of growth motivator, you need to trade small to, till you get through that and make the transition to, okay, I'm, I'm building, you have to build your confidence back and then you feel more comfortable. And uh, it's a normal part of the process. And, you know, you're becoming an evolved human being. Nobody can do it, right? Very few people in this game can do it professionally, which means that you own, you're fully accountable for your losses. You're fully accountable for standing there the next day. You mean, you get back in there, you trade, you trade small and you just build your confidence back. And then your self-esteem is, is regenerated again. You are reborn or however you want to put it by surviving. And, and then nobody can take away that experience of coming back from, from, in many cases, losing everything and starting over. And, uh, you know, you, you this grow. Is, this you, is like a, this is like a gladiator th level inspiration. I'm ready. To, yeah. like, you want to go into battle? Let's go. Yeah. I'm ready. You, Chris, I'll I follow mean, you into the gates of hell here. Right. You go, <laughs> you go, you, I mean, you, you, life is suffering, right? You go, you use the, you, the life pain is growth. I mean, you, I'm sorry. That's just the name of the tune here. And so yeah. you, you, there's no way around it. Right. There's no way around it. It's like you're going to you're actually going to be shaped by your losses. And those will be memories that will shape who you are. And do you, uh, do you remember a particular loss kind of early in your career that helped shape you? Yeah. I mean, I remember my first trade was a winner and uh, I had to run Ooh, to the bathroom. Dangerous. dangerous yeah. <laughs> After I made my first trade. Uh, yeah, I remember, you know, there's, I've been blown, you know, blown out in, in April of 2000 at the high short calls. Mm -hmm. uh, I will, you know, to where you have to walk up to George Kaufman's office at Spear Leeds and say, hey, look, I'm blown out. You know, what do I do? He says, you know, go make it back. I'll spot you. Uh, I, any big loss, you know, in the case of, 
of the Fed stepping in and trying to distort markets. I mean, there has to be a lot of the value players, macro fundamental guys who are either getting out of longs way too early or trying to short them the whole way up. And if you look at the media, right, all the people who are selling newsletters and stuff like that have been calling for the top for years, right? Doom is what sells. And yet right. in, here you are, you're 3% off the all-time highs, 10 years, oh, sorry, 12 years after emergency emergency measures by the Fed. So uh, is, you know, yes, there are many memories, uh, you know, you, you can't get rid of them. It's like, you could throw your, your, you know, what would they say, you know, after a breakup, you put the person's stuff outside in the curb or whatever, and then, you know, that doesn't necessarily give you closure and same with your losses, right? You, you, you can't put your losses out on the curb. You still have to live with them. Right. And so, um, you know, that's just, it's really hard. You don't want, you, you, you take, what happens is you become extremely discerning about the initiation parts of your trade because you've been able to manage yourself out of n- negative or losing or scratch position so well that you, you start to realize that if I'm if I'm more careful about where I step on the roller coaster, I've got a better chance. Of- and that, so, sorry, but that, that, that's, that's kind of what you're getting at in terms of letting pain be your teacher in a way, right? And just sort of acknowledging it and sitting with it and accepting it because then you start to say, hey, I kind of understand this emotion, this experience, and I really don't want to feel it anymore. So let's, let me, um, my, my entire uh, instrument will be tuned in to how I can not experience this, which means being more discerning with your entries for one. Yeah, I mean, the idea is, is that this, and I don't mean to dwell on pain, I just think that this is an incredible game and it's an unbelievable job. And it's, yeah. it's a, like a peak, you ha- literally have a peak experience every day as a human being, your mind is stretched in ways that you have never thought. It's like you, you lose any taste for drugs because reality is so strange. And, um, and it requires that you're just such an evolved human being. Like you have to think in ways that you didn't even think you could. It's like, it destroys all your biases and it's, it makes you just more open to everything. Just like, and then you have to act through situations that you've never seen before. And every day is different and it's becoming increasingly fast and dangerous. It's, it's, it's an amazing game to play. And the rewards are, are of course becoming bigger and they're then they're they're piling up quicker if you're thinking right and you're choosing the right tools and obviously the other the other side of the coin if you're if you're going to be as i say to my friends like who are part-timers now i just say look part-timers are going to get hurt Mm part-timers are going to get destroyed so the game requires it like and luch was saying the same thing he was saying yeah you have to do the work and i can't agree with him i mean that's beautiful what he said you have to do the work there's no way around it it's just a question of where do you want to step on the roller coaster and what tools do you want to use when you bring when you step on that roller coaster and so um making sure that you have confidence and you understand you know if someone has a black box and like you do this or you do this system trade there's just no understanding what's in the black box so you have no confidence but if you have confidence in your tools you're able to sustain the move against you while you because you're going to be early you're never you know as a trader we're we tend to be early rather than late and so we have to be able to have the scar tissue to be able to survive that slight price moving time and price against us before the thing goes our way. And it's not easy, right? Because you're, you're, you're growing and the market's changing. And that's, you know, it's almost as though there makes no point to read any book on trading because the game has changed faster than they can print the books. Right. So in Charlie's model of here of having, you know, a community and then of tr- us who have survived, at least we can tell you what not to do. And then potentially from there, we can figure out, you know, we can write the rules together. And, and I certainly have the best tools in after all these years, at least what I think are the best tools now yeah, to, and can teach that. So hopefully that will help. Um, well, let's, uh, I mean, I, I want to get into, can you give us a little bit of how the story of how you came to start training traders for Goldman? Like how did that come about? And, and maybe we can dive into that a little bit. Um, you know, I was doing brokerage and, and, and filling the paper, um, 
and of course people cycle through the trading desk rule roles um and i where i was i was doing month-long meditation retreats i was accepted into this program um by the the um, dalai lama uh, dharamsala um, mahayana uh, tibetan uh, monks and we were doing month-long silent retreats and part of that training was that you you know the they 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 would always say the monks would always say that if you someone asks you what the meaning of life is you were supposed to reply that the meaning of life was to help other people so i came back to the floor and um you know people got hooked on big positions and they needed to get out and i so i went to goldman and i said look we're going to give these people a fair price we're not going to run in front of them and you were trading for goldman at the time uh yeah and doing brokerage yeah, yeah. and uh not as an employee <laughs> And not as like... an employee. Yeah. 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 No. And Goldman was just like, yeah, right. That's what this business is. This is an exact quote. Yeah, that's right. This is what bus this business is. People helping people. I was like, no, for real. Like we're going to give, we're not going to rip them off as people, you know, if someone's hurt and everybody knows their position, people run in front of them, make it worse. And it's been that way for centuries. And so at least I was, you know, you know, we know the value of certain things options whatever we have our sheets we'll just give them a fair price let them out so they can live another day not a beneficial price a fair price and at the same time what happened was uh, john mack left um morgan stanley he was the uh, the ceo he had come up through the trading ranks and they put in a bean counter i forget the guy's name and all the traders at at, um, at morgan stanley had their uh their you know their corporate spending accounts cut mm -hmm. and uh and they were trying to, you know, chisel everybody on trades because that was kind of what the accountant bean counter, they wanted them, you know, wide markets never meet in, you know, never meet in the middle, that kind of thing. And uh, all of a sudden, all, all the guys at Morgan Stanley heard that, you know, these guys at Goldman were getting all these trades, these big trades when someone's getting hurt, right? They'd go to Goldman to get out. And uh, so all the traders from Morgan Stanley started going to work at Goldman and uh, the guys at Goldman who were up, up in charge came to the floor of the exchange and all the people who had been hurt and let out at a fair price, not a favorable price, w unknown to me, walked up to those guys at Goldman and profusely thanked them. And the guys at Goldman were, were blown away by the reception that they got on the floor of the exchange. And so then they started cycling all their new recruits through my lines. So it was just that they would give me a kid who had just shown up and I would, you know, give them fills and and then talk back and forth with the new kids on the on the on the desk and then they would, you know, eventually get promoted or moved on and uh, I'd get another one and so that just went on for 5 years, but it was all it was all just a, a mix of the the monks and the, then the random guys showing up on the trading floor and the big, the big guys apparently saying, thank you very much for letting us out. And, I mean, this uh, is, this is why I always tell you that you're, you, you got to write a book about your life someday. I mean, the, the combining the philosophy of Goldman Sachs with the philosophy of Buddhism. You know, and, and is, Goldman went on to way outperform Morgan Stanley because of that. And, at least on you know from from a trading perspective and so you know maybe it's not me but it was maybe the you know the idea that the the monks were like you know there it's better to help people like us even in this crazy competitive job maybe it's better to help people than stab them or, or nickel them right and so so then you've got this steady stream of new traders for goldman coming in young young guys or mm -hmm. young women i assume mostly men but maybe a woman or two in if there. any um, of them are watching hello i haven't talked to them in forever but i i would love you guys to reach out yeah um and so what it was there something that you were saying to yourself if i can just get this person to understand you know this one concept or if i can get them to this place you know they, they have a fighting chance was there was there was that clean cut or was it more just like all right this they're going to ask me questions i'm going to answer them and i'm just going to try and guide them you, you know, know they, they think you know the young kids at goldman think they're pretty smart and they and they think they're smart too right and so um maybe i just 
I was helping them look good too with, with, you know, with decent fills and, uh, and then, you know, I don't know how much of what I taught them affected how they did. I can never know. Mm. I can only hope that, uh, whatever I did had the ability to affect them in some other way. Right. We're all, you know, like cause and effect is a valid function. We're all accountable. Like mm -hmm. when you hit the mouse, you make a trade. Right. And even in this master class, there is a certain element of like, how much will we be able to really affect who you are as a person until you actually buy off on us as people that you're willing to risk your money over our advice. Right. Mm -hmm. That's a stretch. Yeah. Right? Like you totally have to totally trust, you know, like really Chris does this and then it's you know it takes a while to to actually integrate and trust if you're trying to change the way you think you just nobody in their right mind just flips a switch and then just does it like this you you, you have to earn the trust of of the advice and and learn you know for yourself and so right. um in regards to the kids at Goldman I, I can only hope that you know, I kept getting new kids. So they, <laughs> something was working. I, I kept right. the business and I kept getting new kids. So, right. And I, they were all about 25, 26, 27 and gung ho. And the typical, you know, was out of the Chicago office. And so um, it was, it was great. It was, uh, it was fun. And, and some of them I know now work at the SEC. Um Ooh in Washington, but, yeah. um, yeah. Um, yeah, I highly recommend, uh, not unnecessarily running in front of people or even I, I recommend helping people if they have a question about trading and Pay, paying it forward. Yeah. That, that kind of, there's some sort of something that inside of you, you feel better by helping people. And then, that builds your self-esteem in case of taking a small loss or making a mistake. Yeah. I mean, that's actually something that we do talk about in the trading psychology section of the course is, um, you know, it falls into the category of what you do outside of the markets and how it affects what, you know, your performance in the markets. And, uh, yeah, we, we definitely go in depth into that. Um, I think that there's a lot of questions for you, Chris, from people in the uh, from people who are live in here right now. So I'm gonna okay. start taking some of those in a second. But oh, here, you... let me can can I quickly just go through the the bio? Right, I worked for Walter Frank until 1986. Mm -hmm. He was great. They gave me ten thousand dollars. I got to keep half plus a salary. Right. So uh, after two and a half years, I'm, Victor Sprandio was one of my customers. He uh, on the floor. And he said, I'll teach you how to trade because Walter was too busy running a specialist firm. Uh, he taught me to trade from 1985 through 1980, 84 to 86 and a half. Excuse me. And he looked at the, the markets as though he was an insurance company, like an archivist or a, mm -hmm. um, an actuarial, sorry, where if, an, you know, mm -hmm. if the moves happened, if, the, if this up move is up 34% and it's been 900 days, is that the equivalent of selling life insurance to a 90-year-old man? He may live to be 100, but it's a bad trade to be long you know, with the move out that way. And so he taught me to think in terms of probability in regards to even in short-term duration in, in regards to if the market's moving quickly in the day, does it have enough juice to go the whole way of the whole day? Um, and after that in 1980s, and then he also made me a member of the uh, CME and the S&P. Mm. So I became a member out there. And then, uh, and brilliant, his book on, on called Trader Vic is a great book. And his rules are posted up on Twitter um, from 1986. Uh, and then I went to work for myself uh, on the floor and have been working for myself ever since. I did brokerage for a while, and that ended in 2008 after the compliance elements became too onerous to even think about doing brokerage. Yeah, um, that game so, changed. Yeah. Oh, and I, I, in 1991, I started, uh, I went to a course at the NYMEX that was a week long on Peter Stottlemyre's uh initial foray into how to segment data when the markets were going to go 24 hours a day you needed a way to segment data so that you could actually sleep 
because we hadn't come across a market that was going to move because we had been watching markets that you know we were there every minute it was open and now all of a sudden there was a challenge of now the markets are 24 7 3 24 5 3 you know 250 days a year so um the education from Stottlemyre was is and still continues to be uh evolving and 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 valid and his data segmentation allows you to remain in touch and in step with the process even though you've gone to sleep and you can wake up you can look and see what's happened as though you were involved and in the ring right right yeah um actually i was just kind of going through some of the questions of what people were asking before i go formally into the q a section but one of them is a question that i had and you know for chris i don't know if it's for you if it's from your personal experience looking at yourself it's if it's looking at other traders you've traded with if it's it's the people you trained um are there key personality traits that you think make people great traders mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I would assume anybody watching is curious enough, uh, and there that's that's uh, important. I think the desire. I mean, you can you can win the lottery. I mean, every day when you get out of bed, you can hit the lottery. Um, there are people who are risk averse and they get a salary, and then there are people who are. In New York, we see a lot of people who have moved here who are like, that small town was too big, or it's too small for me. You know, like I'm too big for this small town. Like right. I'm gonna go to New York and I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna see how I can do in New York. And so I would suggest if you have any of that in you, then trading is is right up your alley. Um, if you want the big show, you're saying, if you wanna play in the biggest arena, then yeah. trading, trading is it. Think yeah. about it, you're competing against the smartest people in the world. Right. Right. You know, as Clint Eastwood, you know, would say, you know, feeling lucky, punk. Right. So you're competing. You got you to be competitive. You got to be confident. You, have to, you got to be you, curious. You have to love it. Right. If you don't yeah. love it, because the only way you're going to survive is, is, is if you're willing to do the work, as Luch says, and you'd love it because you have to be curious in the face of pressure. You have to be able to act through fear standing at the top of a big, you know, ski run or something. And you're like, Jesus, you know, this is steep. And you act through fear and you execute or coming, you know, wherever it is that you, you manifest your need for risk and you can act through fear. If you're good with that feeling, you'll find that this is a very rewarding career. Um, you can't do it for the money. The money is great, but um, it's the money's not the answer. It's, it's like, it's interesting. It's like we're, we're solving a puzzle. My Or Wags used to say we're artists and every day you're either getting a chisel, charcoal, watercolor, or oil paint. You don't know what you're going to get. There's no, right. you know, it is not the same any day. Uh, the other, you have to have courage. You have to have a sense of humor. You have to be resilient. You have to, you have to work hard. You have to have grit. You have to be able to admit you're wrong. You have to be able to be, it's, it's like what we're saying, we're being the arbitrator of two separate cases, you know, the offense and the defense, and you're trying to decide which team to be on. Uh, and the, you know, the difference between the offense and the defense is like 1%, right? And so it's super subtle. And you, and then of course, the, you know, Heraclitus said, you know, nature loves to hide, like the market always loves to hide. Like yesterday, you know, they were down, 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 couldn't buy an uptick, and then all of a sudden couldn't get a downtick for 100 handles. So um, the traits, the, I would have to say that the traits, the the markets actually create the traits in you in a weird way, because if you if you have a problem, the market will find it. You have a bias, <laughs> right? It, the market will find your bias and exploit it. Like a heat-seeking missile for, for weakness, yeah. Yeah, and Taleb says that a lot in, um, in Fooled by Randomness. He says, you know, there are certain people with certain biases who, you know, perform well. For example, the dip buyers have performed very well for the last 10 years, but all of a sudden, if that environment changes, just by the nature of the macro situation changing, and those people can't evolve their toast, their roadkill. So the market will find that and 
And so um, it's more a question of when you recognize that there's a piece of the puzzle in your own makeup that isn't working, that you have to, you have to, you have to come to terms with it. I guess people call that your shadow, but um, you have to come to terms with that, own it, and then either work around it or try and change your behavior. But um, there are the character traits that are missing from your own individual makeup will become apparent to you when you review your behavior in the face of market action. Yeah. And that's, that is something we talk about a good bit in the course. Um, yeah. So I'm going to go, we're, we're going to go into some more of y'all questions. I'm going to give um, some information on the master course here. Um, once I can find my actual it's, web um... browser that I want to share. Um, here we go. So um, yeah, the master course, you know, the reason we're doing this series right now is because the next live session of the master course starts on um, October 19th. So that's coming up quickly. We are currently offering a discount that's $500 off for if you sign up prior to October 1st. This only works for September. Um, I will put that code into the, uh, into the chat, but it's SEPT, like the beginning of September, SEPT 2021 500, um, just numerically spelled out. So you get 500 bucks off whether you do the payment plan or one-time payment. Um, and uh, the master course is simply put is is the only place that you can learn the skill sets that we're going to teach you from people like Chris, like Lucci, like Ron Friedman, like Wall Street Jesus uh, for three grand. There's there's no nowhere else in the world that, that you can learn this stuff. Um, you're going to learn tape reading, trading psychology from Lucci. You're going to learn options trading from Ron Friedman, as well as his trade in the post strategy. Uh, you're going to learn flow trading from Wall Street Jesus. You're going to learn trading psychology and market profiling and data segmentation from Chris. Um, these guys bring incredible experience to the table and they're there to teach you, to teach you life. So, um, the courses are held at, at, in the evening. So it's pretty accessible for everybody. Everything is recorded. You get lifetime access to the recordings and you also get lifetime access to future sessions. So every single time we do one of these, a, a live session, you have, we have people coming back from years prior who are showing up just to see, okay, how is Lucci teaching tape this time around? You know, what's, how are things different now that the, the markets have shifted? Um, we're always they, bringing in new educators. They are changing so rapidly, Charlie. Right. And, and between the crew, um, we certainly know what doesn't work and that evolves into what does work. Right. So, um, so yeah, so, you, you know, we have time before the, before the live course starts, but, uh, this $500 discount only lasts for September. So we highly suggest you, you get on it. Um, Hey, how many, how many hours is the whole master course? It's like now it's become 20, around 23 classes, you know, in each class is let's say an hour, 15 minutes, hour and a half. So that's a ton of education. That's a ton of, uh, a ton of information. Um, and I think we do a pretty good job of breaking it up so that it's absorbable for everybody. We don't just hit you with the kitchen sink all at once. Yeah, for real. Like it, it's a lot of information to make sure that people get a chance. To, I guess they can go back and review it, right? Absolutely. Everything's recorded. You can go back and watch it as many times as you want. Um, for those of you who are super new, super, super noobs, um, you know, we give you an intro course, which is just going to lay out the fundamentals of options before you start. So you're not in right over your head. So uh, I'll, I'll shut up about the course now, but you can learn more about it. If you go to sanglucci.com forward slash MC, like master course, it'll redirect you to this page. You can sign up, you can learn more. You can also set a time, which I highly suggest a lot of you do to talk to our boy Spencer, um, just book a call. If you want to talk to somebody who's been through this before, who you know, who can answer all of your questions, uh, Spencer will will do that. Or you can use this little chat icon in the bottom right corner, and uh, and we'll answer your questions. So, or um, certainly, certainly anybody can reach out to me on Twitter at any time, and I'll just give you my phone number, and I can tell you exactly what any question you have. Yeah. So I'll put Chris's Chris underscore C underscore Katie. Uh, that's him on Twitter. Uh, saying Lucci.com for us. MC is the um, URL for the, for the course. And then the coupon code is sept 2021 500. So. All right. Yeah. Let's the get questions. Some, let's, get some, let's get some questions for Chris. I know that there's a bunch of them. Um, 
This is a really good one, Chris. I like this from Brad Cooper. Chris, at this point in your career, you show up in the morning, your account is 20K. Could you make it? Oh, easy. <laughs> easy. That's what, I thought, that's what I thought you were going to say. Yeah, that's that's simple. Um, uh, I was at the U.S. Open um, years ago, and you know, the first week, the kids all walked through the crowd, and you, they would all see each other because they hadn't seen each other around because they'd been playing different tournaments around the world. And, and I remember one guy saying to another guy, "I'm like, hey, what's your strategy for this match?" And the guy goes, "I'm going to play till I lose." <laughs> and so, um, I think the the goal is is right is to is to be discerning about your trades, which means that you make fewer losers, which means that it's just a question of then sensing opportunity um, because you're not battling back from losses as much. So then it's just a function of how volatile and now the markets appear as though they're going to be increasingly volatile. They're going to continue to press out more cash and the growth is going to slow. So you're going to have, you know, a sort of a roof over the market, but yet there's still going to be a lot of firepower for the market to move, which means that you'll be able to get really good opportunities and you don't necessarily have you can you know the money management rules of risking you know just a bit of you know two percent or whatever three five percent of your capital and then you just start to string you start to string together you know 70 percent winners and you just come at it every day with 20 grand you can make easily make six times your money uh in a year if you're just if you go every day you make sure that you cut your losses and then you know, you just, you monitor yourself. You're like, again, I'm saying, yes, you can do it. That's plenty of cash. Plenty. Yeah. We see people plenty. come into, I mean, just so you know, people come into this course with, with so, some people come in with huge accounts, you know, and that that's fine. Some people come in with less than five grand and then they do just fine. So a yeah. um, couple of cool questions on the course. Is the course mostly focused on option buying as opposed to writing options? Actually, no. it's both. It's, yeah. it's options buying and it is certainly options selling. I mean, Lucci does a whole thing about his, his options writing strategy. Ron Friedman, uh, who is a fucking legend um goes through his entire strategy which a lot of that has to do with options selling so you get a lot uh in terms of, of selling and, and and buying um do you need a special software to do tape reading no you don't um, hey the hey time out um pete stottlemyre uh once said years ago the only way to trade options was from the short side mm, because he yeah. said price alone pr you know price alone auctions auction you know if in other words if something gets if, if there's a high demand the price gets higher which kind of closes off the people buying because the price becomes more too prohibitively expensive and he says so the price alone is an auction process and then the options are a derivative on that so he's like pete's thinking was that the, the smartest thing you could ever do is be short options all the time because it's a second derivative of an auction auction process and price alone is already closing off sellers or and or buyers in the other direction but any yeah do you, i think i think that there's a, i think that there's like a there's a progression for sure both in terms yeah. of your account size both in, in, and your your level of comfort and your understanding of options as an instrument before you start selling them and yeah. we take you through that progression but um i think a, there's a lot there's a reason that a lot of very experienced traders are almost always on the they're always selling options so um um, there, do you need a special software um, for for reading tape? Uh, that's a luch question, really. Um, I can tell you that I use TradeFlow uh, indicators, a very simple one from CQG that comes on Q Trader for if you want that. That's the cheap one, seventy five dollars a month for the whole package. Uh, well, those are but those are like additional. Like you can read tape. I, I think the fundamental question is: Do you do you have to? pay to get access to the tape and the answer no. is no the level no. two and the bid and ask are available in every brokerage platform uh this is not the kind of thing where we're saying hey we're going to teach you this skill set and you got to pay a thousand dollars a month to get access to software that gives you the data so you can do it um you can do this from any brokerage platform so right. um the idea yeah. here is to give you tools that you can take with you for the rest of your life and become self self-sufficient there's not a revenue stream attached in any product well, i'm certainly not selling anything um right Besides, and, besides and, us, of course. Yeah, and, and right. And besides the knowledge, trying to, trying, I've taken 13 people and taught them how to trade on an individual basis on the floor. 11 have gone on to trade um, full time forever. So, and I've had two, so I have had two that have not, but um, yeah. Yeah. But, you know, it's, you, you, and the people who taught me, I'm sure. Victor, who taught me, said it was better to teach people how to trade than build a condo complex. <laughs>
<laughs> That's a quote. So um, um, the turtles, remember Richard Dennis and the turtles, right? There was this whole yeah, thing. Yeah, turtle trading. Yeah, right? dude, I remember there, that. There, yeah. Were, there, there was a whole period where the idea of there was a better, because you got a revenue stream at the time because you were funding traders. In our case, we're just teaching. But, um, you know, 10 million new Robinhood accounts uh, every three months at, uh, at Robinhood. And those people have no clue. So, you know, there's going to be, and if you could look at it this way, right, we need stupid people to make a living. <laughs> We're going to get a lot of really stupid people trying to trade. Don't be one of them. Yeah. Go be learn, learn something before you start lining up options trades. Right. Um, let's get a couple more questions here. Um, okay. So, and just so everybody understands, so Chris, Chris could teach, and we've, we've talked about this, Chris could teach a class every single day on a new topic for an entire year. Um, what most of what we bring Chris in to do for the master course is to focus on trading psychology um, in part, because that's one of the specialties and he can explain, he can break down psychology in a way that very, very few people can. Um, but he also in the last master course, because of for popular demand, we asked Chris to talk a little bit about his strategy and how he segment, segments data and market profiling. And so with that in mind, Chris, uh, what is your trading style? Option spreads or equities, day trade or longer term? What's your... All of the, right, all of those, right? Um, there's a guy who had a website named Stephen Collision who, uh, Ticker Talker, which went bankrupt. The backer with, from Verbier pulled out, but he, he had a great realization was that um, he would execute trades when the one minute, the three minute, the five minute, the 15 minute, the 30 minute, the daily were all pointing in the same direction. And so when we're trading, we need to be cognizant of what strategy we're going to use in what particular situation. If you're going to be buying into a downtrend, you're flipping them for a scalp, right? So you're quick against the trend. However, if you're buying them for the long haul in regards to you're going with the trend on a trend day, you're going to have to be patient. So in regards to the proper strategy would change, for example, if you're a bear and now we get a three-day bounce in stocks and the VIX comes in, would probably be a great place to load downside premium. And then if you get a pullback, then you could spread them out and have huge windows on the downside um, for free. Right. And then you can also scalp. There's no reason that you can't exercise certain strategies all at the same time. You can trade short term. You can also load longer term options positions. Um, but it's a question of making sure that you're in step with the right timing uh, mm -hmm. of each cycle. And I'm sure there are many tools that uh, in this course that will teach you short term timing. Um, but in my own personal, uh, what did I do today? I, I blew, uh, yesterday I blew out my downside. <sighs> today on the ties, I loaded more downside because I didn't have any downside exposure in October, first week of October puts. Uh, and then I scalp alongside in futures on the dips like under that 43 level in the S&P. Uh, then they bounced to 60 near the bell. I sold futures and I bought more puts because they should have rocketed like yesterday afternoon if you're looking for an ABC correction to the upside, which would, didn't happen, right? They kind of failed this afternoon and maybe somebody knew FedEx was bad. And then they just rolled off like marble off the table at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. um, so um, that's what I did today. Um, yeah, I think I think what like to, to give a kind of broader answer to to the question of different styles like we you know there's some courses out there some some educations where they teach you like a very specific methodology and you know the upside of that is that it's simpler right it's like hey one two three when x happens do y when when a happens does yeah. b do b um but the problem with that is that you are dependent on a single approach. You don't have a fundamental comprehensive understanding of how the markets actually work. How do options, you know, work, you know? And so our, Fuck. our perspective is not, we're not here to teach you a single, um, very particular method. You will learn a lot of those, but it's to arm you with, with the comprehensive understanding of, of trading from the perspective of what it's going to take 
in any market condition, you know, the, the way that these things move in any circumstance such that no matter what happens, you, you can trade, you can trade it independently. You're not going to be just waiting for somebody else to feed you a spoon, feed you a trade. Charlie, let me just um, fill them in on the data segmentation part. Yeah, of um, course. So the, the data segmentation part comes from uh, Pete Stottlemyre's uh, first original invention of the uh, profiles. And then um, he decided that in, in a 24-hour environment that the clock wasn't relevant. Um, it doesn't matter what time it is when the market moves. Um, so we needed a way to segment data outside of time. In a sense, right? It's a philosophical argument. What you know? What, for what purpose does time exist? I'll meet you at a specific time for lunch. But if you're trading, it doesn't matter. Like you saw last night, there were 40 handles last night. It's the middle of the night. You're like, what? You know, on top of a 50 handle run. And so, um, so Pete decided that he would use a profile that, when it became what appeared to be a bell curve distribution, and then it broke from the wide spot of the profile, that usually the, the widest spot would be the balance point. And when it broke from that part, he would start a new data segment, okay? So that if the market was going sideways, there would be no data segments. As soon as the market moves, it creates a new data segment. That is outside of time so that you understand that if nothing's happening, there's no change in the data segment. From there, you understand that markets are gonna go vertical from the balance point, right? They go vertical from the balance point. From As soon as they start to go vertical from the balance point, you have a particular strategy that is a go with strategy. Then when the move starts to mature, you start to get some sort of retracements as more people get involved and the market starts to balance again. And it goes through the cycle of vertical to horizontal, vertical to horizontal. In regards to segmenting this data, you are letting the market define itself. And so places where the market, like on a, vo like on a volume profile too, places where the market has spent a lot of time is what is perceived as value and places where there is no very single print or no action at all is obviously places where it doesn't want to be. The idea is, is that if you're going to use this information, there are many different strategies inherent with understanding where you are in the vertical to horizontal um, cycle, as well as the understanding of if you're going to initiate a trade against an area of single prints or against an area uh, that's widely accepted, different strategies there. Um, and then the, the, you can build trend following systems that run outside of time because you're just allowing the market to organically define itself. And therefore you're not using trend lines, which are in a sense become on, you know, a questionable, the same with candlesticks. Why are candlesticks you know, why did, why draw the candle this way when it's just an arbitrary time? Anyway, the point is, is that just so that you understand that, that there are ways to segment data that exist outside of time so that you can be in step with a process that is also outside of time. And you're not getting hamstrung by putting, you're not laying parameters based on time on top of an organic process. Does that make sense? Like you're laying a trend line, which is based on time against a process that couldn't care about time. Yeah. And, so, and, and, and for you guys, if you're like, whoa, he just kind of blew my mind and, you know, and opened up something new. There's a reason that we have three hours in the course dedicated to Chris being able to speak to this. So that's, um, I think you can go real deep with what you're Yeah, I mean, it's about. quite simple to think about, right? If, if the market goes, and you can do this with moving averages, right? Just slap of 65 and a 33 period moving averages, two separate moving averages, 65 and 33 on a 30 minute chart. And then when the lines go flat, that's the equivalent of balance. And so look for a vertical move from there. Okay, 65 and 33 minute, or 
period moving averages and then just put them on a 30 minute chart and watch when the lines go flat and then watch the market go vertical as the lines spread apart, then the market's gonna try and get balanced. And then you can start to adjust your strategies according to where you are in the cycle of vertical to horizontal, back to vertical, back to horizontal. And then you can start to assemble trend following programs from where, you know, if you see that they're over time, that there's a, a higher bias or an imbalance in the market, you can, you can use that. So, right. um, yeah, it's, it's super interesting. It came from Stottlemyre. It's not mine. It's, it, it's Pete Stottlemyre's, uh, basically his capital flow program. It's really good. Um, I don't, I don't sell it or use, I mean, I use it, but I don't sell it. And, yeah. uh, but I will, I will show you how to, you can take all the principles and just apply them using moving averages and a bar chart. You don't have to buy the software. Okay. Um, thank you for going into that, Chris. Um, real quick, Pepe's question. Does the mass course teach futures? Not really. Um, you, a lot of what you learn will be applied to futures. Lucci certainly trades futures at times, you know, um, uh, so I can, there, I can, I, I trade primarily futures. I can teach futures. But but I'm just saying like that's don't don't take the master course if you're coming in looking to trade futures. It's it's really for equities and options traders. We do cover some futures trading stuff, but it's not it's not a course meant for for futures traders. Um, Chris, how do you deal with all the noise these days with the drama on CNBC, um, Wall Street bets, Robinhood short interest squeezes? I've just turned off the TV and focused. You only focus on certain stocks and trade them only. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. I mean. There's two two arguments here. Um, again, Pete Sotomayor would always say, if you're a fastball hitter, don't try and hit curveballs, just crush fastballs, right? Stick to your knitting. And then there's the other argument that says human beings are not insects, right? Insects are specialists and human beings are generalists. So I lately, uh, yeah, no, uh, CNBC is a no. Um, even <laughs> Twitter is, is kind of... Um, it's good for news, but you know, price action is price action creates the news. So, and why something's moving isn't really relevant. If you're if you're trading, you should be wondering about where, like where is this going, is much more important than why it's going. And I get there are people who need to know why. And uh, but I would suggest from our perspective that we're more interested in the outcome of the price action. Is the price of something speeding up or slowing down? Right. The speed of something through time is more important than any news. Right. It's kind of a momentum based game. If interest rates are zero, that means that there's no such thing as value, which means that everything is a momentum game now, which means that is the price of something speeding up or slowing down through time? much more important than price, way more important than why. And by, you know, CNBC exists to sell advertising, newsletters, you know, all of that stuff is exists to sell it, right? And they're, it's like even the stuff they teach in college is behind the curve because we're out here on the front lines. And there's just, you know, so it's just, is the price speeding up or slowing down through time? Is it attracting? Are more people coming to the party, so to speak? Yeah. All right, this there's there's uh, my uh, my alarm bell is going off in my head because we're we're starting to give away uh, <laughs> we're starting to give away the farm. So um, only price pays. I, yes, whoever wrote that. Yes, that's so true. Yeah, um, is market pro Gretchen market profile is uh, like a point and figure chart but stacked together. Okay, it's like a you can just Google it and you'll see it's the same sort of X's and O's, but with letters instead of X's and O's. So yeah. And uh, 65, um, Lasse Sunberg, 65 and 33 period moving averages on a 30 minute chart. And you get an idea of what the market is, any market is balanced. And then as the moving averages move apart, market profile is yeah. definitely worth yeah. learning. Um, yes. And you can learn that you can learn from Chris in the master course. The next one starts, uh, October 19th. Um, and next week I will be back with wall street Jesus. Um, so the, our series continues. I'm going to be talking to Jesus about what separates pros from, as he calls it, the riffraff, which is non-pros. I think his perspective will be very interesting for you all to hear on this. Um, appreciate hey, you all Charlie. being here. Uh, Charlie, yeah. um, someone asked uh, books that we recommend. Um, 
I recommend uh, Mark Douglas's books, as as Lucci was recommending, are great. Um, uh, and, the, and the only Trading problem zone's that, always a good one. Yeah, yeah I mean zone. they're they're all old. Uh, Market Wizards is good. It's also reaching reading ancient history. Um, there's a book on psychiatry, a positive psychology called Character Strengths and Virtue by Seligman that I really like. But it's it's like a dictionary. Sorry yeah. to interrupt. All good. Okay. All good. I think uh, Chris. As always, thank you for being here, man. Thank you for sharing your perspective. Thanks yes. to everybody who was here asking good questions, participating sorry, in this. Sorry for the sales pitch. It's kind of outside of our wheelhouse, right? We normally just teach and <laughs> and uh, and bat around. And um, it's hard to, I mean, the, the advantage of this is that we're teaching what's working now. And so, um, again, sorry if it sounded like a sales pitch. Good. Thanks, guys. We'll see you next week with uh, with with uh, Wall Street Jesus on here. Okay. Talk to you soon, Chris. Thank you. Bye.